What's going on, golf fans? It's your boy, GS Luke, here with our DFS fades and sleepers for this week's RBC Heritage. Now that we've got ownership projections to go off of, we can take a step back, make some of those game theory decisions, and try and get that much-needed ownership leverage that we'll need to take down those large field 70, 80,000 entry sort of GPPs. So in this video, I'm going to break down some of the higher-owned players that you might want to consider avoiding this week, our fades. And then on the other side of the spectrum, some of our sleeper plays, the more low-owned diamonds in the rough that you can get to to try and differentiate your lineups towards the top end of the board. So without further ado, a lot to talk about here. Let's go ahead and get this thing started. We'll start with the fades, which first off, going to fade the highest owned player on the slate, and that is Patrick Cantley, who has a fantastic track record around Harbortown Golf Links, but in this elevated field this time around, you've got to ask yourself, is he worth investing all of your lineups into, or at least half of them, because as of right now, I have him at 24.5% ownership, which means if you're going off that 2x roll that a lot of people out there are going off before these large field GPPs, well, you got to put them in half of your lineups, and for me, that's that's something that I'm definitely not willing to do. So let's talk about why he's chalk, right? Let's talk about the good side of it there for Patrick Cantlay. First off, it's form right? You take a look at the recent form. We'll get to event history in a second. I was getting, getting a little bit ahead of myself there. But when you take a look at recent form, T14 at the Masters, top 20 at the Players, um, players another Pete Dye design, and then top five at the API. So only playing the best of the best fields, making the cut, finishing top 20 pretty much every single week. But when you combine that with his elite level course history, where you can see second place last year, T3 in 2019, um, first trip here, finished T7 in 2018. Um, does have the one missed cut mixed in there, uh, but in terms of you know long track record, right, having just top ten after top ten, um, that's Patrick Cantlay for you, right? Last year's champion, um, Jordan Spieth hasn't been nearly as consistent around here, um, and pretty much the entire top of the board, um, even some of the better guys like a Sam Burns, right, who has a top ten, also has a missed cut. Sanjay has a missed cut mixed in. Matt Fitzpatrick too. Um, Patrick Cantlay has the most consistent top five, top 10 equity. So uh, that's why a lot of people are getting there. I understand it. Even the shots gain metrics are there. You can see gaining a stroke per round off the tee, also um, close to half a stroke per round on approach. So I understand the sentiment. What I worry about is people overlooking these, you know, big two up top, right? John Rom, Scotty Shuffler, both of them are five, six percent lower owned than what you have here for Patrick Cantlay. We'll get to Jordan Spieth a little bit later on, but even these guys on the 9K range, like Hovland, Morikawa, who he talked up as a core play, um, Cameron Young, who killed it here last year through the first two, three rounds, are all going to be seven, eight, sometimes even 10% lower owned than what you have with Patrick Cantlay. And though the course history is there, we know he's in form. I've seen this story before. Patrick Cantlay getting out there, the 20, 25%, and then falling flat on his face. I mean, after all, you take a look at the event history, he did miss the cut here in 2021. So it's definitely within his range of outcomes. And Something to consider is that this event history is in a much weaker field. Outside of 2020, which he didn't even play here for, right? Um, you can see that's his only start over the last five years that he didn't tee it up. Um, the field has been lackluster. I mean, even last year with Jordan Spieth won, he had four or five guys that we'd consider truly elite tier players. And now we have pretty much all of them, but Rory, Mac more Rory McIlroy there in the field. So I think you're going to get... Um, stiffer competition than what you've seen with these top 10 finishes in the past. And perhaps rather than a T3, a second place finish that you had there last year, that's something like a you know T4 or T5 finish, um, considering that you have the Roms, the Schefflers, and that middle tier range is all so much stronger this time around. So I think a lot of people aren't considering that. He's definitely still a solid play, right? In terms of the projections, right? He's top 10 across the board in terms of fit, um, which for number four in pricing is actually not really good enough, right? He's actually um, modeling a little bit worse than his price tag there. I understand the play, but I don't think he should be 24.5% owned. Next up, we're going to go a little bit further down the board uh, to JT Poston as a fade. And I'm a JT Poston truther. I'm somebody who's talked him up on the channel uh, more times than I can remember. And it was before he really ever had solid performances. You know, he'd go out there, finish top 25 every once in a while, and we could play him at $6,300, $6,400 at literally no ownership. And now that he's ascended to at least your average tour pro, I'd say well above average tour pro. I, I'm a lot more bullish about his skill set than I I think most people are. Um, he's starting to get attention. 
He's $7,300, and I have him at 11.4% ownership, and a lot of it's the event history. I mean, kind of like a Cantlay, he's killed it at this course over the years. Um, there are a few things to worry about. What's his price tag? $7,300. Where are we at there? There's good old JT Poston. T3, cut, T8, T6 finish, um, has diced up the course over the last four years. The recent form's been pretty decent, too. It hasn't been elite-level stuff, but T38, right, T10 finish, did miss the cut at the players, um, so has one missed cut there in the last two of his last three starts. Um, the shots gain metrics are there, too, right? There's a reason why we played him over that stretch, right? We were able to get that T10 finish, for example. Um, very consistent across the board, just rock solid, right? I wouldn't say he's elite in any one category. He can be elite with the putter. Um, hasn't really been over the last 24 rounds, so that's a little bit surprising to me. The issue with JT Poston here is not the skill set, right? It's not the course history, as we could see. It's the ownership. He's 11.4% owned. He's probably $500 to $600 too expensive based on where he's typically priced in this strength of field. And there's guys around him, like Billy Ho, we'll talk about later, but not just him. Seamus Power, Denny McCarthy, who I talked up, K.H. Lee, Mav McNeely, Webb, Tom Hoagie, Taylor Moore, right, who's just a few weeks off of a win, who are objectively better players that are half his owned, three, four times lower owned than what you have there with Poston. In, in almost every circumstance, I'd much rather make that pivot. So it's not just Poston here. There's a lot of players in this range you could say that for that are just two, three times higher owned than their peers. And in almost every scenario, they're not worthy of being that chalk. So I would recommend just go out there, right? Make that game theory approach. Um, maybe up top, you take a little bit more chalk than you do down low because down here, right? These guys are all pretty much the same kind of player, right? Some may have elite course history like a JT Poston, but at least in my mind, it's not worth playing somebody that's going to be three, four times higher on than their peers just because they've had a decent track record around here the last three, four years. I'll remind you guys, if you want access to all of my modeling projections, everything that is blacked out on these spreadsheets, make sure to check out my Patreon page on there. I post updates, my player pool, you get access to the Discord to ask me and the rest of the community all the questions you've got, throw ideas off them, sweat your bets, player pool, all of that fun stuff, and all of the prop content that I'm posting throughout the week, which includes my slips, write-ups for all of the different categories posted on Prize Picks, Underdog, and other betting sites uh, to help you out with your research and simplify your process, right? Save you a little bit of time, uh, put all of the information that you need in one centralized place to go out there and uh, hopefully cash out for some GPPs and for some bets. So there's a link down below to that. It's $10 a month, gets you access to all the golf stuff I'm posting, uh, whether it's there on their prop or the PGA DFS side. And now for the other side of things, our sleeper plays, the guys being a little bit overlooked for these large field GPPs. And first off, we've got Jordan Spieth, who I've got at 8.2% ownership right now, which I did not expect coming into this week. And I think a lot of it comes down to the pricing, right? He's the third most expensive. After Rory withdrew, he's your next best player, right? Obviously returning champion, getting a little, a little bit of a price bump because of that. And he finds himself $600 less expensive than a Scotty Scheffler, $700 less expensive than a John Rahm, and people would just rather get there. And because we have Mega Chalk, Patrick Cantlay sandwiched between the two, you know, people just can't get the Jordan Spieth. And I think they would be remiss not to. Let's take a look at the recent form, which I would argue he's the hottest player in the world, right? I mean, he's not going out there. He doesn't have a win like John Rahm or Scotty Shuffler, but he has a T4, T3, T20 finish. He was in contention at the players for a little bit, and then a T4 at the API. And before that, I'll remind you, to start 2023 was also on a heater. And if you take a look at the last 24 measured rounds, it's backed up by the shots gained. Is gaining in all four stack categories 0.6 shots per round on approach, and the more and more you zoom in, the better and better he looks, right? In fact, over the last 12 measured rounds is the th fourth best player in the field, right? 0.1 shots worse than Patrick Cantley, only 0.3 shots worse than your Masters champion, uh, John Rahm up there, and only half a stroke worse than, of course, Scotty Scheffler world number two at this point. So I think a lot of people think there's more separation between the form of these players um, and then a Jordan Spieth than there actually is. He's 
a hair behind, right? Which he doesn't have that win, right? He doesn't have as many of those top end finishes. And frankly, from the talent level perspective, those other three players might be better, but Patrick Cantley is not three times more likely to succeed than a Jordan Spieth. In fact, Scotty and John Rahm are not two and a half times more likely to succeed, to succeed than somebody like a Jordan Spieth. So for me, I think, you know, returning champion obviously likes the golf course, is playing well. I know there's all the narrative out there about how tired he is, right? How he's got to change up his schedule and whatnot. But how many times have we heard somebody complain about their irons going into their week, complain about their driver, complain that they're maybe a little bit sore, haven't practiced as much, and then go out there and win the golf tournament. I mean, it happens all the time. So for me, if that's going to put him at just single-digit ownership, uh, the sandwiching in terms of the pricing, right, is going to keep the ownership low. You know I'm a Jordan Spieth stand to begin with, but especially when we get him in form at a course he likes at low ownership. T to me, there's no reason not to play him. So I know... Obviously, these ownership numbers are a little still early in the week, right? It's still Tuesday at this point. But if he's going to be two and a half, even just twice, you know, as you know, the ownership there with Patrick Cantley versus uh, Jordan Spieth, I'm going to make that pivot all day, let alone when it's 3x, like what we have there right now. Next up, we've got ourselves Billy Ho, who is the pivot off of JT Poston, and he's six times lower owned. Yes, that's right. Billy Horschel, PGA Tour multiple time winner better player on the official world golf rankings than JT Poston, has decent course history, hasn't really had that pop performance around here yet, is six times lower owned. Ridiculous if you ask me. So if you take a look at the course history, like I said, it's been okay. T5 finish has made four of his five cuts, has two top 25 finishes in a row around here, which I know maybe not as flashy as T3, T8, T6, but he's just as experienced, if not more experienced around here, and at least has that one top five finish to boot. And you can't tell me that that makes him six times less likely to succeed. And you may say, oh, well, it's a, it's a recent form thing. I, I understand that, sure. He does have better form. You can see, you know, Billy Horschel, he's gaining in three out of the four categories. JT Poston, same thing, but overall was gaining about point six shots more per round. Uh, the off the tee's really been killing Billy Ho. And over the last 12 rounds, it's a similar story. But once again, that that's not worthy of being six times higher round. In longer term, I think I don't think this is a hot take. Billy Horschel, better player than JT Poston, right? Again, I'm the JT Poston truther over here. I'm telling you that Billy Ho is just a much better player. And again, I think if you think otherwise, you're, you're pretty crazy. You're pretty, uh, maybe you can say that JT Poston has more potential going forward, right? As one's a relatively young player, Billy Horschel is a relatively old player. But if you're talking about just pure talent level, right? Um, nine out of 10 people are going to side with Billy Horschel. And as of right now, looks like six times more people are uh, siding with JT Poston, which I just can't understand. So at this sort of ownership level, it's a no-brainer play for me. But kind of like pointing out JT Poston, it's not just Billy Ho that I'm getting to, right? There are a lot of guys that are between two, maybe 5% ownership at the bottom end of the 7K range here that are excellent plays, that are just better players than some of their peers. And, you know, just to point out a few, McNeely's like a little bit over 5% percent he's by far I think one of the more talented players in this range Sepp Straka you could say that about there's there's a bunch of guys down here that are just low owned gems that you can get to that are three four times lower owned than a JT post and, and that's that's an ownership decision that I think you should make pretty much every single time that's all for this week's Fades and Sleepers. Before you hopping out of here, first off, smash that like button, but also go ahead and comment down below your number one fade for the week. The rule is gotta be over 18% owned, but go ahead and let me know one of those you know top end options that a lot of other people are getting to that you're maybe not so sold on it will be avoiding in your player pool. But until next time, guys, best of luck with those lineups, any outright bets that you decide to go with. I will be going live at 7 p.m. Eastern tomorrow, our usual time slot, and that'll be after walking the course. I'll be waking up super early there tomorrow, driving up to Hillenhead Island, scaling the course, getting a look at a, a few of the players' practice rounds, and reporting back to you guys there for the stream. So looking forward to that. Looking forward to seeing you guys there. Bring any questions that you've got. We'll talk about the weather, any wave edges to be had. We'll talk about some of the chalk. 
um, some prop analysis for anybody looking to get some last second cards in, uh, whatever you guys need to touch on, right, to get ready for this week. I'm um, also going to remind you, there's a link down below to the community contest. If you want to get in there, have your lineup reviewed on Monday, make sure to join so you can reserve your spot, play for some bragging rights, a little bit of money there on the side. Uh, but most importantly, right, it's a, it's a good way to centralize all the lineups uh, for review there on Monday so that we can discuss them, go through your thought process, and uh, have a little bit of side action there as well. So looking forward to it, guys. Link is down below to that community contest, and I'll catch you guys Wednesday for that live stream.